Welcome to week four of the book of Revelation. And believe it or not, we are going to venture out of chapter one. <laughs> so thank you all for those who are coming, although I've been uh, abusing you before we uh, push play on the camera. And uh, welcome to all those who are watching on the Internet. Uh, if you haven't watched the previous uh, um, Bible studies, it would kind of help because if you jump into the middle of this, you might be a little bit uh, confused of what's going on. Last week was like one of my favorite Bible studies I think I ever done, uh, at least in this short series. But uh, did the cloud rider this week. We are going to do the patient Bride, In other words, the patient church or, you know, like patient endurance, right? So not the patient like in a doctor patient relationship. So here we go. Uh, that's what we've been abusing those who come to Bible study tonight. So uh, you guys who are watching on the Internet are not privy to that. So here we go. Father, we love you and we thank you for all the good things you do for us, Lord. And uh, thank you for your blessings. So look, as we get to know you more, we, we understand your attributes. Man, I don't even know why that you even take time to love us. But for some odd reason, you do, Lord. And because of who you are, because you're all powerful, yet you choose to be merciful. Because you are holy, but you choose to show us grace. How can we not love you, Lord? So ask you that you send your Holy Spirit to, to guide us and to teach us and to show us these things in your word, what the Spirit says, Father. You're, you're speaking to the church. That's us. And we need your help. We need you to give us that knowledge and wisdom that, that these folks can't get from me. And, uh, uh, you know, none of us needs to trust our own intellect and instinct, Lord, on this that we need to hear from you. So we'll, we come before you come before your throne and we ask you lord that you just bestow this upon us and spend time with us and thank you i just felt you so in jesus name we do pray amen. amen so as i said tonight we are going to begin in chapters two and three i have both chapters already worked out uh i don't know how far we will get probably not all that far knowing me and my track record but um um we are going to do, let me, let me start with my outline. I kind of changed it. Oh, no, nope, we're not going to do the outline yet. So before we do, I need, to, I need to do a correction from last week. I knew in my mind exactly how many chapters is in the book of Daniel. It is 12. I know because I even said last week during the Bible study that 8, 9, and 10 are all three standalone prophecies. That 10, 11, and 12 is the same prophecy. Should have probably been the same chapter, right? So I know that there's only, and that's the end of the book of Daniel. I know that. And I don't, I said it like three or four times that there's 14. There's not. It was, I was, I was excited. <laughs> So I just want to I don't ever want to say anything that I know that isn't correct about the Bible and let it continue on. So that's why I wanted to take a moment to correct myself. Now, correction number two, I've been doing this outline here. And for some odd reason, I'd left out chapters four and five. That was pointed out to me by a very lovely couple that comes to the church. So I added it to our new outline and I just merged it in because it is part of. And I, I was leaving out chapters four and five, but I left it here as part of the transitioning from the old to the new. And I, I'll explain it to you when I get there. So chapter one, we are going to do a little bit tonight. We'll just spend a few minutes, but that is the reunion between the disciple whom Jesus loved and Jesus himself. They haven't seen each other for, uh, let, let me not get that wrong. They haven't seen each other for, what, 60 years? So imagine how John would have felt getting to see his his beloved teacher, his his rabbi, his you know, Jesus is all those things. Right. So that's the reunion. Think of what he would have how he would have reacted. He's he can remember the human Jesus. And then he sees the the revelation of, of Jesus standing amongst the the, the candlesticks or the lampstand. So uh, uh, that's why I call it the reunion is is these two love each other. Uh, 
chapters three and four, that's what we're going to start on tonight, is the message from the Son of Man to his bride. And I almost called it that, but I didn't. I called it the, 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 the patient bride. But these are uh, messages to the church. We'll, we'll dig into that here in my, I guess it's kind of like an intro to chapter two, I'd say. Uh, four through 19, going from the old world, the old heavens to the new world, the new heavens, the new earth and the new heavens. The reason why I just went ahead and incorporated four and five, I thought about making it uh, its own uh, standalone, but I didn't because there's three sets of judgments within the book of Revelation. I know I've said this a few times, but there's the, the seal judgments, there's the trumpet judgments, and then there's the bowl judgments. And if you read the book of Revelation carefully, you pay attention, you will notice that all three of them begins with a worship service. There's worship happening. That's what brings this on. What brings the second coming of Christ whenever it's the battle of Armageddon and all the stuff that you know and see in Hollywood movies and all that. What brings that is the martyred saints praying, Lord, when are you going to revenge us? And Jesus said, when the full number of those uh, 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 have been martyred, that's so it's a it's an answer to prayer, to worship. So that's why I went ahead and incorporated four and five, because that's what ushers the the seven year tribulation. That that's two chapters. OK, so that's why I just put it in there, transitioning from the old to the new. And of course, 20 through 22 is the reward. This is what we're working toward, what we are, what we strive for, what our hope is based in. We have to we have to know these things in order to have that hope. So we are going to also talk a little bit about reward tonight. So. Uh, um, and, and this is how I put it. Last week, uh, we began to look at the conversation between the groom and his bride. See, John is still a part of the church, right? He even called himself, I'm your partner. Uh, uh, verse 9, he says, I, John, am your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in patient endurance for which Jesus had called us. So, you can turn to Revelation chapter one. I'm going to start in verse nine. I'm going to kind of read it kind of quick. I just want you to remember this because it's important for chapter two that you can remember this scene here. And again, I don't like cheesy artwork of what Jesus is. I really try to, to shy away from it, but it kind of helps to give you a little bit. But so I just read verse nine to you. Uh, but Jesus, or that John said three things. He's your partner in suffering. He's your partner in God's kingdom. And he's also a, a partner in patient endurance. And he said all three of those is what Jesus has called you to. The book of Revelation becomes much more understandable. The questions, the things that people fight about, the things that people will argue about start becoming a lot clearer when you understand that Jesus has called us to suffering, to being a part of the kingdom of God, and to endure that suffering. All right, verse 10, it says, it was, and pay attention to the past tense of all these, it was the Lord's day, and I was, <clears throat> wait a second, I missed a little bit. Let's go back to verse 9, because he says, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching, the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Verse 10, it was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly from behind me, a loud voice like a like a trumpet blast. It said, and this is in red. This is Jesus speaking. It says, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the seven cities. And here's my map again. I'm going to go back to my picture of Jesus, but here's my map. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And if you notice, it's just a nice little circle here going, going clockwise. So going back to this. It says, when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, I'm going to, to be a spoiler here that we're going to learn at the end of this chapter that the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches that we just talked about. These seven churches, okay? 
uh, verse 13, and standing in the middle of the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man. That's what we talked about last week, the, the Baranash. And, and I found this out, too, is that's what got Stephen killed. Remember Stephen, one of the first deacons in the church? Is, that's what he was claiming is that, that Jesus was the Baranash. Okay, so here we go. Um, he was wearing a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were polished bronze, refined in the furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. Verse 16, he held seven stars in his hand. We're going to talk about the stars tonight. Uh, the seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like this was like the sun in all of its brilliance verse 17 when i saw him i fell at his feet as if i were dead and if you ever notice that whenever the, the prophets or the apostles are really bad about when they see an angel they fall at his feet and the angel says get up don't worship me right this guy doesn't say that jesus doesn't say don't worship me he says, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I live forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death in the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and those things that will happen. Now, I'm going to take just a slight moment, a uh, 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 exit ramp to show you this. Because this is important for our Bible study tonight. Verse 19, I'll read it again. It says, write down what you have seen. So these are the things, you know, he, he's already seen them at this point, I guess. He said, both the things that are happening now and the things that will happen. Okay, so he's writing down the current events in John's day. And he's also writing down the things that's going to happen in the future. This is important. And I, I can show you where the turning point is, because there's a turning point in the book of Revelation and it's in chapter four. If you want to go there and look, I'll read it to you. Chapter four, verse one. I'm going to start in verse one. Yeah, it's in verse one. Revelation chapter four, verse one, it says, then I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven and the same voice I heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. That's the same voice we just talked about. Right. And the voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. That's the turning point. And the reason why I stress that is because there there's a lot of debate on that, that you know, the futuristic People that sees the, the book of Revelation is all happening in the future. There's people who say it's in the past. And uh, th this letter was written in 95 A.D. So they'll even say that, that the things that John talks about was already fulfilled in 70 A.D. But it didn't because it's it's chapter four, verse one, that things happen in the future. So that's in the future from 95 A.D. So it couldn't be talking about 70 A.D. But going back to chapter one, what you have to remember is the letters going to the church, because I hear a lot of this. And I know this is part of my intro into this. A lot of people say and I hear the teaching and I'm not disputing it because I just can't. But they say that the seven churches that we talked about in the province of Asia that I showed you the map of that they stand for different parts or points of church history. And they'll say like the, the, the city of Ephesus is first. They say that that's the, the apostolic uh, era. And it ended when John, the last, the last apostle who was alive, he was living in, in Ephesus, that whenever he passed away, that, time, that period of church history had left. And then the next church history, it, it steps up at Smyrna and it, it actually starts with, I don't know, Antigamus or something like that. And it runs to when Constantine lost the battle to the Ottoman Empire, the, the you know, at, at Constantinople and they go forward. So, look, I understand that teaching. I've heard that. I have 
read it and understood it, can't argue against it. I can tell you this. As we read chapters 2 and 3, there's nothing that says that in the Bible. So although it could be possible, I'm not going to teach it in that direction because I told you that you know, I didn't do the rules tonight. I kind of told you I was going to stop doing the rules over and over, but I'm not going to shoehorn to make verses to say something that, that they don't actually say. We're going to look at the text itself. So as I say that, the text itself says that this is happening in 95 A.D. when John is writing this. OK, so I want to let you know that going back to chapter one, verse 19, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. So these things that he's writing right now are things that are happening at his time in his life in 95. Verse 20. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Here is a classic example of the text. It is it is explaining itself. We don't have to guess at what it means. It says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the seven lampstands, this is in my notes. The seven lampstands equals the seven churches, the seven stars. All right, here we go. This is a controversy. And, and th there is many different uh, interpretations of this. I'm going to give you two. Because to me, there are only two that's liable. I think there's like six or seven I've, I've read. But the, the two is that the, the, the stars, it says, are, are, the, are the angels of the seven churches. So there are seven angels. Now, some take that literal, that it is actually seven angels. Others say it's the seven pastors of those seven churches. So I believe that the correct word in everybody's translation here, I believe, all says the seven angels. If you go and look, like mine has an asterisk that says it could have been interpreted messengers. Now, both are true. Angels are messengers of God. You think of Gabriel coming to Mary and says, God has sent me to send you a message, right? To give you this message. The angels come and deliver messages. They don't do stuff on their own. They are sent by God the Father to tell specific human beings specific messages. They are messengers. Also, God speaks to a church through a pastor, that is a messenger. Whenever our pastor asked me to preach at our, uh, our anniversary uh, uh, service, I wanted to do the direction of the church. I felt like that was part of the sermon that God had given me. And I went to our pastor and I said, can you write me a brief <laughs> description? I know that's funny. A brief description of, of our, you know, what our, our vision of our church is because that is not my job. That's the pastor's job. He is the messenger of the church. It's his job to pray, to seek the Holy Spirit, to hear from the Holy Spirit, and to, live, to deliver that message to the church. Amen? Amen? So, I lean toward the stars, the angels, as being pastors. More for this reason than any other. Says, look, because we have a message from God the Father. And he's given it to Jesus. Go to chapter 1 and you'll see that. Now we have Jesus giving it to John. Now John's going to do what? Either give it to a pastor who's going to give it to the church, or he's going to give it to another angel, who then how is he going to get it to the church? So he, is it an angel of Ephesus? that the, you know, the city of Ephesus has its own angel. And now John is going to give a message to an angel. And then the angel is going to give it to who? So that's, that's a whole other process. So it seems to me just logically, simply, that it just makes more sense that it would go God the Father, Jesus, John to a pastor than going to an angel. And so anyhow, that's why I lean toward that. All right. So the seven stars in Jesus's right hand, the seven pastors of the seven churches in my humble belief. And that's a whisper because I just the Bible just kind of leads me to believe that. Which ought to scare you if you come ever try to come against a pastor of a church? Where's the, where's the pastor at? In Jesus' hand. So that's scary ground. Not that, 
just because you have a title of a pastor, a pastor means that you have free reign to do what you want. They don't go unchecked. They have accountability also. But you better make sure that you're on God's side if you do try to. I don't want to bring, raise a charge against the pastor because here he's in the right hands and not all these churches are in the right spot. The pastor is still where? In his right hand. OK, kind of scary, but but it's good for us. All right. So um, let's start. Let's start with uh, chapter two. But before we do. <laughs> so, look, I'm see, I'm, I'm key, teasing. This is important because and I, here it is. All seven churches, the letters that we're getting ready to read to the seven churches, follow this basic parameter. I call it the five elements of the message to the church. Every time, it, it'll, it'll start out with, to the church of Ephesus. I'm just using Ephesus because it's first. To the church of Ephesus. That's the recipient of the message. All right. Next, it'll go to an identifying characteristics of the Son of God that we had just read. That's why we read it. Now, it doesn't stand a whole a hundred percent true. The, most some of these elements are not a hundred percent true. This is one because it will describe something about Jesus that that church needs that that wasn't used here. But most of them are. And I have them written in my notes and I'll refer them back to you. Uh, for for example, we'll just go to go to Ephesus and it says, um, this is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Look, we just read that in, in, in verses 13 and 19. I'm sorry, 13 and 16 in chapter one. We just read those. That's being described. The reason why is because there's no doubt about who is speaking to the church. This isn't a message from John. It says in a message from any other apostle or evangelist or elder or teacher, this is the this is a message from this guy. OK, that's what he's saying to it. So that's the second one. First one's the recipient, the church. The second one is who the message is coming from, coming from an identifying description of the Baranash. All right. The third uh, is the the body. That's how I learned. I tried to go back to like grade school whenever you learned how to write a proper letter. What in the center part called the body? Meat of the subject, however you want to think of that. So, look, look, they're both affirmations. I know what you're doing and you're doing good. Then there's rebukes. Some churches get all affirmation and no rebuke. Some get no affirmation and all rebuke. So, but that's the body, the, the bulk, the message of the of the the message of the message. So that's the middle part. Then remember, this is a Pacific message to a Pacific church. But Jesus does make it universal. Everyone, he says, for those who have ears to hear. OK, so what he's saying is this this is he's going to address some problems going on in each Church, and I say church, he uses the city that, that the church is in, right? And even at that, I find it hard to be that generic, or I don't mean generic, that all encompassing. Because look, if God could speak to the city of Portsmouth, right? I'm going to go ahead and count us. I know we're in Lucasville, but count us as part of Portsmouth. And he says, Portsmouth, I see what you're doing. And you're doing this, you're doing a really good job at this, but you're lacking in this. Well, you can look and say, well, we're not doing that. You know, that's that church over there that's doing that, right? So there was the same issue whenever he says Ephesus. He's doing it in a generalization of that area, okay? It can't mean that every single person in that city is guilty of the exact same thing. That's another reason why I have a hard time believing that, that these seven churches are talking about seven different periods of church history because there's no way that everybody within a 250 year span of time is all doing the same thing as believers. So there is a universal message to the church. What he tells the church of Laodicea, it does go for us. 
The same message that he tells to Smyrna. It's the same thing for us. We need to to beware of the of the warnings that he gives. Okay, so there's a universalism to the messages. Last but not least, every one of them will say and to the victors, they will receive this. And he gives a reward for what he wants you to do patient endurance to to you know suffering and, and all right so look the only thing that i can say about this universalism here on my five elements is sometimes four and five is switched over about half the time but that's still these five basic these five basic uh elements within these messages and i, I know i went through a lot of that and i'm probably about Halfway through my Bible study, I hadn't even read chapter 2, verse 1 yet. But we will go through these seven churches a lot faster. And that's not my goal. But when we look at that and see that every one of them has these elements, they make sense as we read them. Okay? Let's begin. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. And it says this. I write this letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. So there's our, our recipient. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is absolutely, and again, as I said, Revelation chapter 1, uh, verses 13 and 16, identifies this as Jesus, the Son of Man, the Baranash. We know who this message comes from. Okay, Verse 2. And we start getting into the affirmation. He says, I know the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but they are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without complaining i'll stop there now so we know more about the church in ephesus than we do any of these other churches and the reason why is because we have the letter to the the, the, the ephesians or yeah we have the the book of ephesians or the letter of a, the epistle of the ephesians we have first and second timothy where paul was writing to timothy who was the pastor in Ephesus. We have first and second and third John that he is sitting in Ephesus when he writes this to the people in, in Ephesus. So we know more about this church than we do any others. And that's because outside of Jerusalem, this is the, the hub of all Christian Christendom. So uh, we also have what did I name? Six letters already, Ephesians, first and second Timothy, three, three, yeah, six letters. We also have John or the book of Revelation that was written from Ephesus. So we know more about that church than we do any others. So what he is talking about is the evil people who claim that they are apostles, but they are not, is we're going back to those dreaded old Gnostic teachers. They are calling themselves apostles. They're saying, we have this special revelation from God himself. He spoke to us and tell, told us that you can sin. It doesn't matter. You can still go to heaven. You can still do. It doesn't matter that the Bible says sexual immorality is a sin. Don't worry about that. It's okay. Go ahead and do that and you're still going to go to heaven. That's what Jesus himself is calling those people evil. He says that they claim that they're apostles and you have discovered that they're liars. Now, Jesus doesn't mince, mince words either, does he? He comes right out and says it. You have discovered they are liars. You have p patiently suffered for me without quitting. So because this is a this is a mixture of the world and religion coming together and, and Gnosticism. It is pagan religion coming in together with Christianity and trying to create this new hybrid uh, belief system. So that's that. So let's just go to verse four. But but that's the that's the Gnostic teachers. And I say it because we're going to see him again. You know, here, look, are they that far apart? 
That's walking distance, right? So you can't say, well, there are Gnostics here when there couldn't be none here, you know. So you know, using common sense to know that, that this is probably widespread. So, okay. Verse 4, it says, but I have, so, so far we have, the, uh, they've been affirmed, nothing but good stuff. Verse 4 says, I have this complaint against you. It says, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. And he's telling them to look in the mirror. I want you to look at yourself. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. And that is repenting. That's what he's talking about when he says, turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Because then he even says, that if you don't repent, I will remove, I will come and remove your lampstand from a place among the churches. Again, a serious warning. Stern warning. Now, I'm, go I'm going to probably say this more than once. I want you to see that it wasn't Jesus didn't get he, he, he told him they was doing a good job by not listening to the Gnostic teachers. But you're not you don't love me or each other as you first did. Now, I cannot express how important that is. I try. But I, I let Jesus. Huh? They come to him. And they said, what's the what's the most important commandment? If I was to do anything, Jesus Messiah, son of man, what would you tell me to do? What did he say? Love God. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second one is just like it. Love each other. Right? So love God, love people is more important to God, to Jesus, than even rooting out the Gnostic teachers. You did a good job at doing that, but you don't love God. You don't love each other as you should. You need to go back and repent, because if you don't, I'm going to remove your spot from the churches. Verse 6. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. So that, again, is, is the Gnostic teaching. And I don't know if you have ever put this together. You probably haven't. And I got it bookmarked. But I'm going to go to Acts chapter 6 just real quick. I prefer that you stay right there in Revelation. But Acts chapter 6 talks about the, the church. And, and you know these, the, this chapter, the church is having a hard time meeting all the needs of the people, including some of the uh, widows is not getting their fair part of the food. Right. You know what I'm talking about? And they said that they went to the apostles. and They said, what do you think we should do? Apostles said, well, you know, our job is to pray and to, to learn and to study and to teach the Bible. You got to pick out seven other guys to do food, right? Well, the seventh guy, I guess what his name was? Nicholas. His name was Nicholas. And, and evidently, um, I'm trying to find it. And I'm not even going to try to, to, to <laughs> it says Nicholas of Antioch, um, and then it gives in, in parentheses afterward, it says an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. So he wasn't a Jew in the beginning. He was converted to Jewish faith. Then he converted to Christianity. Then he was made one of the first seven deacons. And then evidently he was an apostate from there. Somebody had some convinced him that you can sin and still go to heaven. So now this Nicholas guy is trying to teach other people that. And that's what Jesus was saying. He says, but, I, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. So, again, Jesus thought that was a really good trait. That was not enough to keep their place in amongst the churches. They had to repent for not loving God not loving each other the way that they did. And look, I'm not throwing any rocks at them. I'm bad about a routine. Anybody else? I can give you my routine down to when I brush my teeth. If I put my socks on that yet, that day. Because I haven't. Right? I can go through, what I, on my way to work, I got a 20 minute drive from my driveway to my parking lot to where I work. I can tell you what I pray and what order I pray it. 
I can tell you what I do to, when I get to work. I pull out our church devotional and I read it and I think about it. And I read other scriptures and I got a few other little pamphlets that I read and other books and prayer books and stuff. And I read those. And then, uh, you know, I, I work half of my day and, and go to at lunchtime. I pull out my Bible and start doing this Bible study. I'm bad about routine. And I, I have a, just a sneaky feeling that that's what the Ephesians have fell into this routine of doing church. And they stop, they stop stopping and smelling the flowers and to realize what they are working toward, what they are trying to accomplish by loving God and loving other people. It just becomes routine. We go through the church motions. You go to, you get up and you go to church because it's time to go to church. I want to be a good Christian. You go to church. I want to read the Bible. It says I got to read the Bible. You know, preacher told me I got to pray. All right, Lord, let's get this over with. You know, that, that's the routine stuff. And that's, that's what Jesus is, is rebuking, is quit doing that. That's the relationship. It's the love that's the important part, not getting the rules right. Yes, it's important. I got this. You, you know, you're doing this right. What's important? The relationships, my relationship with God, the, our relationship with each other. That's what's important. Without it, you're not part of the church. That's just what Jesus said to the church. So that, that was the body. Moving on to the universal message of the church. Verse seven. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. See how it gets universal real quick. All right. Anyone with ears must hear and listen to the Spirit and understand what he says to the churches. That's plural. So what he's saying is, this is an absolute message for the church in Ephesus. They're the ones who, they're fighting the, the, the Nicolites. They, are, they have fallen and have not loved God and loved each other that the way that they once did. They're the ones who need to repent, but we all need to watch out for that trap. That snare, it can happen to us. May I say it? It is happening to us. Do you think that the church today loves each other the way that God commands us to? Honestly, get on Facebook. Get on Facebook and, and look at the way that Christians talk to other Christians. Are we loving each other the way that God commanded us to? So that's the universal. All right. Now for the best part, the rewards, right? It says to everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now, I, I have went and actually looked these up. And if you go to Revelation chapter 22, he describes that picture. And I wanted I kind of wanted you to. To see it, you're welcome to listen to me if you don't want to jump ahead. Sorry. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 says, and this is John talking, right? It says, then the angel showed me a river with the living, or the water of life. I'm sorry. The angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Verse 2, it flowed down the center of Main Street. On each side of the river grew the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop for each month. These leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. All right. So that's a picture of what the, the reward of what the new heaven looks like. A river flowing from the throne of God with the tree of life growing on each side of the river. So we go back to the message to the Ephesians as he says, I will give you fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. If they do what? If they repent, go back and love God and love each other as they're supposed to. If not, he's going to remove them. Next, church of, well, we'll just read it. Verse eight, because we start off with the recipient first. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Smyrna. So there we again, we got exactly who this message is to. Now, who's it from? 
This is a message from the one who is the first and the last, who was dead, but is now alive. So we see that verse in Revelation chapter one, verse 18, because he said in it, it says, I am the I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and the grave. So that way, the church of Smyrna can know beyond a shadow of a doubt who has given them this message. Verse nine. Because we move straight to the body. Verse 9, it says, I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. So, if I might, and I will, on the physical, outside, what the world sees is that they are suffering and that they're living in poverty. But spiritually speaking, God is saying, but you're rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. So they have people who are are um, speaking junk on them, right? They say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Now, there is a big description that I've heard on a on a uh, commentary I didn't know this and I really don't know it. I'll I'll just do it real briefly of what I can remember. But do you remember the letter that the apostles wrote to the first church? It says not to eat food uh, that was sacrificed to animals, not to eat the blood. And third, not no sexual immorality. Right. Well, the part of the pagan religions that was coming into the area from Greece and all that. Part of their worship to go to church, you had to have sexual relations with a temple prostitute so that they were setting up these these people who wasn't Jews, who didn't want to do that, was saying, I'm Jewish. And the and the Roman soldiers was leaving them alone because you could belong to a a more ancient or, or I should say an older religion than what they had. But you can't, they didn't they didn't view Christianity. So so there was people who wasn't really Jews saying, but I'm a Jew, just so they wouldn't have to live that life. They wouldn't have to go to those pagan temples and whatever for Zeus or whatever. So they was even coming up with their own churches. I'm not a Jew. You're not a Jew. We'll just start our own thing here and we'll, you know, do whatever. We'll have communion. You know, we'll have pizza and, and diet Pepsi, you know. So so they're they're Jews, but they're not Jews. Or they're claiming to be Jews, but they're not. And that's what he's saying is um, they say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. So they're not part of the Christian. They're not even part of the Jewish religion. They're on their own. Verse 10, it says, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. They haven't started to suffer this suffering yet. What they are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you in prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. And then I got a period, so I'll stop. 10 days. Don't get hung up on trying to describe what 10 days is. Remember, we're going to shout what the Bible shouts, whisper what it whispers, and stay silent on what it's, what the Bible stays silent on. This is a whisper. The ten days is we really don't have a definite definition of what the ten days means. Except for this. It leads me to believe that there is a distinct starting date and there's a distinct ending date. Does that make sense? It's a short time. It's a week and a half. You're going to suffer for a short time. And then it's going to end, right? That's the 10 days in my eyes. Don't try to make more out of it than that. Verse 10 again. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you in prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. But you were, but if, and that's a big word, but if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. All right. So um, that is a reward, the crown of life, eternal life. That's what you get when you go to heaven. So that's what he's saying is if you stay faithful and and hear me when I say it's because I think this is a huge message throughout all of the book of Revelation. The church is going to have to suffer. Remember that the, the, I already talked about the 
the uh, martyrs underneath the throne of God. When, Lord, are you going to avenge our blood for what these people on the earth has done to us? And God says, not yet. The, f- the full number of you are not here yet. When, you, when, when those who are set to be martyred, when they're all martyred, then I'll come and revenge you. Okay? So that's what he's saying. You have to remain faithful even when facing death. And then I will give you the crown of life. Keep going. No, so that's the end of the body. So as you can see, it was all affirmation. It was all uh, um, these good things. You're suffering. You're suffering at the hands of these people who claim they're Jews, but they're not. They're actually in the, in the synagogue of Satan, right? Your suffering will, will have a, a starting time and it will have an ending time and it will be short. But if... You remain faithful to me even when facing death. Then I will give you eternal life, the crown of life. So then he makes it a, a, a universal message. Verse 11, anyone with ears must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. So everything that just applied to Smyrna, that is a Pacific message to them, also apply, applies to us in our life. Then their reward. Whoever is victorious will not be harmed by the second death. The second death, I'm not going to turn there because you're probably tired of hearing me saying it, but in, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15, if you want to go and look at it later, but it's talking about throwing death, hell, and the grave into the lake of fire. And it says this is the second death. So what it's saying is, if I go back and, and read it one more time, it says to anyone with ears must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches, because whoever the, whoever is victorious, whoever is willing to remain faithful, even when facing death, you will never be harmed by that lake of fire. You're going to have the crown of life. Understand the message? Next church. Verse 12. This will be our last one. It says, verse 12 says, write this letter to the angel in the church of Pergamum. So there we have the, the next recipient. I'm, I'm leaving this up so you can see it's following it, is it not? The recipient. Next one is from who, it's, from who it is, the description of the Son of Man. It says, this is a message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. That was back here in Revelation 1.16 where it talked about the sword that comes from his mouth, right? Verse 13, because we're moving into the body. It says, I know that you live in a city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. Now, we don't know anything about who he is, except for he's a martyr. And all we know, and this is what I wrote. We don't know anything about this guy except for he refused to compromise what he believed. He refused to compromise when it came to his message, his gospel message, the good news about Jesus Christ, even when facing death. He never compromised, right? And that's what he called him, my faithful witness, right? We, we, we've heard that from Jesus in parables. Welcome my my faithful witness into the paradise that I've created for you. You know, well done, my good and faithful uh, servant. So, so th- this is absolutely a good thing. You refused to deny me when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan City. Verse fourteen. So that's good, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate. Some among you whose teaching is that of like Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Let me let me finish reading. I'll go back and and, because it gives a brief explanation. It says he taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. Okay, so this is what happened real quick. Uh, I'll just use Balaam's name only. The children of Israel are traveling from point A to point B, and they're going through this king's property. This king decides to go to a prophet. This guy's a prophet. He hears from God. I'm going to go to this prophet and get them to curse these people so I can destroy them because I've heard of what they did in Jericho. 
Their God is with them. I need to curse them so their God won't protect them. So they, so the king goes to Balaam and says, Balaam, I want you to curse them and I'll give you $100,000. Balaam goes, deal. He goes in, in prayer and goes, God, I want you to curse these people. And God says, I'm not doing that. They're my chosen people. I, I'm, I'm the one who's directing them. Right. The, the, the cloud of pillar, the, the pillar of, of cloud at day and the pillar of fire at night. I'm the one who's leading through this territory. I'm not going to curse them. And that's where we get the famous. I will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. That's who God was speaking to when he said that. Right. So Balaam goes back to the king and says, I can't curse him. God won't let me. So he tries to convince him again. Balaam goes back in prayer. God tells him no a second time. So Balaam gets this idea. Oh, I can, I can get God on their bad side or get on their bad side of God. Let me say it like that. I can get them on God's bad side by teaching them how to sin. So he goes amongst the camp of Israel and he teaches them exactly what he says here. Um, he said, Balaam showed Balak, which was the king, I didn't want to mention his name because Balaam and Balak, I kind of get those two uh, mixed up sometimes my, myself. But Balaam showed Balak how to trip the people of Israel. He taught them to sin. He was teaching the children of Israel, God's chosen people, how to sin by eating food that was offered to all, uh, uh, idols and for committing sexual sin. So that's what he is referring this back to these people. It's among the church in Pergamum. They're teaching God's children to sin, that it's okay. Now we, First John went a long ways into telling us it's not okay to sin. It, it, we are to strive not to, but if you do, we have a we have an advocate, right? We, if you do confess, because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. But that's not we just don't do it willy nilly. We don't teach people to sin. You don't teach the church to sin because that's what he's calling them. He's saying he's saying he, he they're like Balaam. And that's not a good place to be. Balaam was killed for doing this. All right. So verse 15, it says, in, in a similar way, you have uh, Nicolaitans. And we go back to the Nicolaites that we had in the Ephesus, right? Uh, you have some Nicolaitans among you who are following the same teaching. So these people are, are Gnostic teachers. They're teaching the church it's okay to commit sexual sins. It's okay to commit adultery. It's okay to fornicate. It's okay to, to be a homosexual. And, and he goes th the, through the whole list. It's not okay. You're living in sin when you do that. You're not uh, out of God's love. It's, it's, it's not that God doesn't love you no more. It ain't that you can't, be, you can't start a relationship or be in a relationship with God. But that's not okay. You can't live life that way. That's not what God wants for you. OK, so that's what he's saying is, is you have these people who are, are teaching them. And it's, you know, remember, he says, I have this. Comp I'm going back to verse 14. He says, I have this complaint against you. You tolerate these people. You allow them to do it. Now, th that's where I start getting flaky in my walk with Christ is how do I be meek? And not tolerate people. How, how do you be humble? Right? Uh, humble is the most confusing thing in the world to me. Because I've got to be humble. But I'm not allowed to know that I'm humble. And I'm certainly not allowed to tell anybody that I'm humble. Because then you're not humble. <laughs> it's confusing to me. But how do you be a meek, humble believer? And if you put your hand down and say, we're not tolerating this anymore. But that's what Jesus is getting on them for. Verse 14, I have these complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like a Balaam. All right. So this is how to this is how to fix it. Verse 16, repent of your sin. What's the sin? Tolerating the people. He's not speaking to the Nicolites. He's speaking to the church. Repent of this sin. Or I will come suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, he's not fighting against the church. 
Jesus doesn't fight against the church. And if you don't know this, when he says, when I come suddenly and I'll fight against them with the sword that comes from my mouth. If you remember, right, that's how he that's how he defined himself all the way back in verse 12. This message is from the one with the sharp two edged sword. So that's what Jesus is saying. That's why he defined himself to this church this way. What he's saying is, is they're going to be here on the earth whenever I come suddenly and that sharp two-edged sword that comes out of my mouth in chapter 19 is going to destroy these people. Verse 17 comes the universal message to it. Remember, uh, uh, okay. Verse 17, a fourth one here. Anyone with ears... To hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. So, again, this is a Pacific <laughs> message to the church in Pergamum, but it goes for us too. And boy, can the, can the church here in America be guilty of telling people that it's okay to sin? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's okay. It's all about love, right? Love God, love people. You can do anything else you want. I had this argument with a guy at work. And I'll tell you his first name because it's part of the story. His name was Doug. And he told me I'm allowed to do that. God told me I can do that. And I said, that's an absolute lie because it's a sin. The Bible says that what you're doing there is a sin. And he says, no, God told me I can because he wants me to be happy. So anything I do that makes me happy, God lets me do. And I said, what, where do you read that in the Bible? He said, the book of Doug. I hope he's watching <laughs> because that is teaching like Balaam. <laughs> You're teaching people that it's OK to sin whenever a church looks the other way. Now, don't get me wrong when I say this. A church is to love everybody. When 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 somebody comes into our church or any other church that's addicted to drugs or alcohol who who are living in sexual immorality we are not to 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 chase those people off we are to love them and and to teach them what the bible says and to love them give them the the good news so that they can be saved and then we allow the holy spirit to do what he does that that is our purpose here but we can't say you're fine keep on doing that god loves you anyways that's the wrong teaching. So the, the, the church here in America is awful about it. Man, we, got a, we, have, we have a humdinger of a church here in Portsmouth that I just seen the billboard. It's, it's the billboard right there by Sonic. If you ain't seen it yet, go by and look. It's got a big rainbow on it. And, you know, we accept all these people. Well, I agree with the message that you accept them, but they're not part of the church. You can't let them have that message. You can't say you're fine in your sins. You're not. There's none of us fine. So I'm going to be generic and, and some of the people in the room will know what I'm talking about. But see, I, I had an issue with asked to sign a list of sins I will not commit. And I will make a um, I will make a covenant that I won't commit these sins. My goal is to not commit those sins. That is my, uh, you know, the, the, the glorious standard that I can't get to. That's my goal. But I don't want to say I, I will never do that. You know, so uh, I know I'm getting away, getting away from the message, but um, um, that is our goal is to live a holy life. God says, be holy because I am holy. So it, it goes back to not a, a, not a thing of... of of committing sexual immoralities or eating foods that was sacrificed to animals. That, that's, the, that's the rules part. Go, going back to what we've already talked about, it's a love thing. Is, if you're willing to do those things, if you're willing to say, my sin is more important to God, you know, my abilities to commit adultery in my life, I want that more than I want God, you're not loving God the way that you should. And you're not loving your fellow man because whenever a, a, a man commits adultery in his marriage, it affects other people. It affects his wife and his children. And, you know, you have seen this scenario more than I have. Well, as much as I have. So uh, um, 
it, it, it's a love issue. It goes back to a love issue all the time. It, it, so, um, verse 15, in a similar way, you have some Nicolites who are following this or, or, or follow the same teaching. Verse 16, repent of your sin, the church, repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The universal message. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. So that's again, that's us. We can't tolerate people who tell that it's okay to sin. We have to do it with love. We have to do it with humility. We have to do it with grace. But we can't tolerate it. I know the last time I preached here at this church, I said God is trying to teach me how to di- how to. How to disagree with other people without being disagreeable. Anybody hear me say that? I could have, I could have had that lesson today whenever I yelled at my boss for doing something wrong. I need to learn how to disagree with people without being disagreeable. I was very disagreeable, yelled at the top of my lung in the middle of the shop, you're a liar. <laughs> so, disagree without being disagreeable, moving on. <laughs> Because he says, here we go, here's the reward, the victorious. It says, to everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. So I know that you guys know of manna, where it came from during Moses' time when the children of Israel going through the wilderness. Did you know that the manna is being hidden in heaven? That when we get to heaven, whenever we have the new heavens and the new earth, the way it reads here, we're going to eat manna. I'm excited. Because all I can do now is read the description in the Old Testament, and, but we're going to actually hold it and test it, get taste it and see what it is. It says, um, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in, in heaven. And, and I really found this one fascinating. And it says, and I will give each one a white stone. And on that stone will be engraved a name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Now, the white stone really isn't too many places. I, can't, I couldn't find it anywhere else in the Bible to give you a, a reference to. But what it means is during this time, whenever you went um, before a judge, man, I thought I was doing good on time too. When you went before a judge, you was given either a white stone saying you was innocent or a black stone saying that you was guilty. So what he's saying is, if you repent, you don't put up with these evil people, I will give you a white stone. You will be innocent whenever you come to your judgment throne. And the Lamb's book of life is opened. You will be innocent. You will have a white stone. On, you, will, you will be given a white stone. And it says that name will be put on it that no one else understands. How does it say it? I'll give each of you a white stone and on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. In other words, this isn't a generality. This is specific to each an individual. This is your stone and it means something to you. I don't know what the new name is. It's, it even says I'm not going to understand it. But you, the, the, the stone will be written a new name that no one understands it except for the one who receives it. So it's going to be personal. It's going to mean something to you that it doesn't mean to anybody else. Make sense? All right. So let's quit there. I knew we wasn't going to get through the whole chapter. And actually we did pretty good. But do you see why I started out with these basic elements? Because it helps us roll through it a little better and with better understanding. So next week, <clears throat> our goal, <laughs> I, I set goals, we don't hardly ever make them, but our goals is to go ahead and finish chapter two and chapter three. And w- we can, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying to hurry through any of this. I will take five weeks with each church if that's what it takes, if that's what the Holy Spirit leads me to do. I'm not trying to rush through anything. Look, I, so let me, let me stress this and then I'll pray and get us out of here. This is important messages. This isn't chapters two and three just isn't noise till we get to the good stuff. I know most people come to hear the book of Revelation or who are watching on the Internet. They want to know when's Jesus coming? When's the signs? What's you know, they want to know the big question stuff. This isn't material that just gets skipped over. And, And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of teaching the book of Revelation and saying, let's just start with chapter four, because that's when it starts getting good. 
This is the good stuff. This is the message from the Barnash to the church. This is stuff that we need to heed. Are we guilty of these things? Probably. <laughs> but, but, you know, these are the things that we need to heed. And if we find, as you examine yourselves, our church and ourselves, if we see that we're guilty of these things, we need to repent. So here we go. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your message. We thank you for sending your son to die in our place on the cross. Lord, I haven't done much of the good news today. But Father, we, there is a good news that we can't be good enough. We can't be good enough to not have to face the second death and not to face the lake of fire. But we know that because Jesus died in our place on the cross, Lord, that if we, if we repent of our sins, if we turn away from the world and turn toward you and follow your ways and try to live a life. And it's not that we can, but we try to live a, a repentant life, Father, that, that is not perfect, but we try to live life the way that you tell us to. That, Father, you will give us a white stone, that you will give us the crown of life, that you will give us fruit from the tree of life. All those promises, Lord, are for each and every one of us. If we can patiently endure. We love you, Lord. We ask you that you continue. As we, my brothers and sisters who, who is watching on the Internet and those who are here, as they read the Bible in their personal time, whenever they uh, uh, listen to other commentaries, other Bible teachers, whatever that they're doing, Lord, and they're reading the book of Revelation, give them that Holy Spirit to speak to them and reveal the truth. It's right here in front of us. And as I said in the beginning, Lord, you didn't write this to the scholars and to the to the to the seminary students and the college professors. You wrote this to every everyday normal Christians, just like us with normal everyday brains. So reveal these things to us. Let us know your truth. Let us keep the kingdom of God first in our life. And you can take care of all the stuff while we worry about kingdoms, when we worry about doing your work. Most of all, Lord, may we be a church that are doing these things in, in your, your letters to the church. May we be a church that are doing those things, Lord. May we have a love for you, a zeal for you, as we did in the beginning of our relationship with you. May we have a love for each other the way that you command us to, Lord. May we not tolerate evil or false teaching in any way, <laughs> but may we do it lovingly and humbly, Lord, with grace. So we love you, and uh, I ask you that you keep us all until we come back next time. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. See you next week.